Let me get this session started. We wanted to include something about solid state systems, but there are so many vendors and so many peculiarities to each one, and uh, I didn't really know how to even start trying to contact them and see what they wanted to present. So what we decided to do instead was have kind of a panel discussion and a group discussion about solid state systems and what you might want to know if you have questions about just even basic troubleshooting, what you can do, things that we've learned the hard way. You don't go in and just start poking around in them without blowing apart sometimes. And so uh, Peter has got some sample ideas of things we can talk about, but any of you, this is supposed to be a time where you can ask questions. So um, why don't you start? Sure. So um, I actually wanted to start off by asking our panelists, our lucky contestants. Um, <laughs> Make sure you follow the, uh, yeah. to the letter. Yes. Well, that, that, this is the first thing. With a given problem, so I'm going to say we're going to walk into an organ, and the organist is complaining about a problem. And so this is an electric action organ, solid state systems, um, and so if the problem is a dead note, what's your gut reaction? What would be the first thing you would look at as the source of the problem? Well, I always tend to start at the beginning. I know it's an odd concept, <laughs> but check that the key is actually supplying voltage to the input of the device, whether it's a standalone diode switching system or a fancy ass multiplex system. You want to know if it's being told to play the note. If it isn't, then you know where to look. Okay. Um, and then I would work my way through the chain of things toward the magnet. And uh, other people will do it the other way around. They say, okay, C sharp is dead, D sharp works. Well, I'll go there and I'll take a clip wire. There you go. I'll run it from D sharp to C. And son of a gun, if they're both, not both dead. <laughs> um, so, yeah. It's, but that has told you something. <laughs> and do we learn from it? <laughs> now we go to the other side. Yeah, we go to the seaside and make the same thing happen. Um, the problem with troubleshooting the organ is that there's so much of it. I mean, if, if you go to fix somebody's doorbell, it's simple. You've got one switch, a transformer, and a bell. The organ, we have hundreds and hundreds of these, each circuit of which is simple by itself but can look overwhelming in the, in the aggregate. Mm -hmm. So that's the key to servicing it, is to not look at it as a exactly. huge instrument, but to it's narrow the problem down to the simplest possible question. It's also don't, on the, don't look for some huge answer right away. Look for something very simple. On the first page of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it says, don't panic. <laughs> and that's, that's really good advice, uh, but you might just say, don't be intimidated. Uh, if you have 61 circuits and 60 of them work and the one doesn't, find out what's different. Next. Can I ask a question? Sure. This is a real problem. <laughs> Organist complains uh, that on the grate, occasionally, F sharp and G play the same note on either side. Only occasionally. Where would you start looking? I would start looking at any elements in the system where those two notes are adjacent. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't look in the cable connecting the keyboard to whatever it's driving because the unlikelihood of two wires that serve adjacent notes shorting is, you know, it's not there. So if it's, if it's one of those diode panels where mm -hmm. it's laid out chromatically, I would look at the tracks between the two. This is a, a Peterson 4000 system, mm -hmm. and everything shorts, the couplers, everything. Well, that, that's great. That's the first question, mm -hmm. is what is affected? Is it just, it happens on the grate? Well, is it the grate chest or is it the grate <coughs> keyboard? And what happens if you have couple. a grate to pedal on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Just, just to try to... It doesn't couple to the pedal, but, it cup, but anything coupled to the grate mm -hmm. will... Do you know the answer? No, because oh. it happened uh, while I was gone, and the guys went there. And, yeah. Uh, were, you know, what is it? Well, it's clearly a plumber. The IC chip. 
that, that, that this is this is sounds like a logic problem. Mm -hmm. This is this is a, this is a keying on a logic problem. Right. Because if it's if it's if it's moving to division to division or anything moving <clears> to the division, it's not the jack. Well, look, you're you're doing what everyone else does. You yeah, suspect the black magic first. The stuff <laughs> you least, we the least you trust. Don't do anything this. about it. I had a situation in in Portland, Maine, where I built a new console using existing EM Skinner keyboards. The key contacts were in very good shape, so I put silver on the choppers and left the the wires, in. and they started having runs. And it turned out that the moisture in, in the contact box was leaking, and it happened again. Mm -hmm. This is a perfect example of we don't learn. I did a similar thing at Harvard, where I reused um, a Skinner pedal board, and I kept the contact rail. And I ended up going back and changing it. But the first time, I've seen this twice, and this is not solid state stuff. Mm -hmm. The first time was on a pin board that the uh, Minneapolis organ builder, John Van Dallen, I'm not like you, I'm not discreet, I, I name names. <laughs> <laughs> he had this organ built in Europe, and uh, it had a pin board. I, they probably had some solid state in there, I wouldn't have been there. Um, but he was having runs, and it turned out that there was pitch in the wood that he had, in the solid wood he had made the pin board out of, hmm. that caused a running between two hmm. notes. It's called dendritic action. What is it called? Dendritic action. Hmm. Mm. I'll, I'll talk about, yeah, I'll talk about it tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> but but the worst one I ever saw in terms of running was when um, Tony Bufano, who used to be the curator of organs at Riverside, called up and he said, the organ's going mad. I said, Calm down, Tony. What is it doing? Don't panic. Don't panic. I haven't read the book yet. But. Oh, yeah. And so I thought, well, well, I, I turn on the, the two foot flute and the positif, and the shamad blower comes on. And I couldn't think of anything. Okay, I'll come and look. So, this, uh, by that point, he had replaced the Reasoner and Aeolian Skinner relays and switches with SSL diode systems. And there was a big pin board. And so I took out my trusty meter and uh, said, okay, play C. Okay, C came up and I had my next wire in C sharp and it should be zero, but it was like one volt. And I ran along and, you know, all the keys and all the stops had voltages somewhere between zero and, and 12 volts. So the next thing to do was to unsolder the wire from the console and see whether this stray voltage is coming from the never-to-be-trusted solid state, or <laughs> from the perfectly reliable, simple organ console. Well, it was coming from the console. So we followed this wire. It went into a sort of a six-inch lead pipe through the brick wall. And then two stories down, it came out into a little cubby hole behind the console. And everything looked fine. But I said, I said we're going to have to look in the wall. Tony loved this. He got a a ball peen hammer and he started breaking bricks up. Well, it turns out that that, that lovely, confidence-inspiring conduit was this long. It only went through the brick wall. Oh, wow. And what lived on the other side of the brick wall was probably all the plumbing in the building. There were the roof drains and the steam lines, and it was so wet and steamy in there. They, uh, when Aeolian Skinner rebuilt the Roosevelt organ there, they retained some of the old silk insulated cable, and that was what went in the wall. And we got you know enough bricks out so you can put your head in and your flashlight and don't drop the flashlight. <laughs> the, it, the cable looked like the snake that swallowed the pyth the python that swallowed whatever. Yeah. It was a big pregnant bulge in the building in the middle where it had gotten wet, and everything was cross talking. So I suggested they you know, forget about cables and put in a multiplex system. It was too new. Tony's answer was to get them to spend $28,000 on waterproof conduits all over the building and then pull a lot of new cables through it. So, why was I talking about that? <laughs> well, that, that Peterson system is still shorting between Oh, yeah, well, it's probably the Peterson system next. And they, they were trying to fix it uh, uh, two hours before Yom Kippur. Oh, so it wasn't oh going to work. Mm -hmm. 
Oh they ended up cutting one of the wires that the organist least needed. Yeah. And Which that, key do you play in, sir? That's right. And he was happy, <laughs> happy that at least he didn't have the short. But what was the solution? Uh, we have, have to, to go, go back to some other day. TVA. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that kind of brings up one of the points, you know, Dick said, do you trust, distrust the black magic box or you, do you look for something mechanical? That's something I know we've come across many, many times. It's the key contact that's mechanically shorting where you don't think it is or there's something mechanically wrong. Um, blaming the solid state first is not actually what you want to do. You want to make sure that everything's mechanically sound before you then start investigating the black magic box. Right, you do that on both ends, the input end and the output end. Yeah. Yeah. Then you pick up the phone and show. And you mentioned using a meter. Is it ever not okay to put a meter on a solid state system? No, it's always okay. I mean, provided the meter is set, set to do properly. Yeah, set properly. Now, if it's set to measure amps and, and you put it across <laughs> the <laughs> Let the smoke out. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Has anyone talked about the smoke theory of electronics? Do you keep putting the bigger fuse in? No, the no, smoke no, comes no, out? no, no. This is, this is <laughs> so all of these things like the transistor in the metal can or the ICs, which are... you have something solid state there? No. Okay. Um, they're all in sealed packages, whether it's epoxy or metal or ceramic. And we all know from experience when something happens and that case cracks, the smoke comes out and it no longer works. So the theory is that some at some point in the manufacturing, smoke is injected <laughs> into these devices and that, that facilitates their, their operation. And if something happens to the thing, the smoke comes up, and clearly it doesn't work. Right. Well, you told the Oh, it's wonderful. It comes oh, That's my first question. Two questions on the phone. What color is the smoke? <laughs> Where do you know where it came from? from? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Going back to the meter question. Did Phil? Lucas Electric's in, a, in England. <laughs> if Sorry. you look, there's a part number for a kit that reinstalls the smoke back into the <laughs> No, we can't. <laughs> oh, those British, they're so clever. <laughs> okay, the multimeter that I have, when I'm trying to test to see where, where a note is playing or not, it reads 12 volts whether the note is playing or not. That's right. Explain that. Please. Okay. Well, I think you're talking about an SSOS multi-system. That's right. The, the driver devices they use in that particular multiplex system were originally designed for the automotive industry. And the car guys had this idea that they would just run, instead of these big, beautiful cable harnesses that were so expensive, they would simply run plus, minus, and data all the way around the car. And you would have this driver that was serial, data in, Two volts out in your left rear corner, and it would do the um, parking light, the brake light, the backup light, the turn signal, all that kind of stuff. So, one of the requirements of the, of the design of this chip was that it would send information back to the central computer to tell it if a bulb was burned out. You know, and we, and we have this, these lamp failure uh, indicate, uh, warnings on our cars. And the way it does that is it sends a little trickle of current through every output. And when the trickle goes away, it knows there's a problem. And enter the pipe organ. We, we put this in the organ, and, and <clears throat> if there's nothing connected to it, and you take your meter, it's going to re read the supply voltage. Because like, like the dude up there with the, the water tower and the hose, if there's no current flow, the voltage is there. But if you were to have a magnet connected to that, it would immediately pull that voltage down. Right. So there's a good example where a meter can tell you too much, a digital meter can tell you way too much, and uh, the wonderful tool I use is a little test light that has an alligator clip and a little light bulb in, and it, it will tell you, it will not we're talking, in, we're right, talking right. incandescent. Here. We're talking incandescent. Yes. We'll talk about diodes in a minute. Um, it's also very useful <clears throat> as a feed. So let's say you have, you have a magnet and you have a plus and minus terminal and you put the, uh, 
the uh, light bulb thingy cord on the terminal that's the return polarity, and you touch the point of it, and you say, okay, play the note, and no, I said play the note, would you please play the, I am, okay, well, we're not getting voltage. The other way you can cleverly use this thing is to feed current. You can move the clip to the feed terminal and touch magnets. You can go along a pin board and very quickly say, okay, 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 oh, bright, something's wrong here. And that, that saves smoke. It's, it's, and not blow the system up. And not blow the system up. So, um, and there's also, there's one of those on that back table, there's also a similar thing that has an LED in it. It looks like a, a long black cigarette. And it has a lead and a point and one LED in it, which lights up red if the polarity is one way and green if it's the other way. And that's useful and it can still pass some current, but it's limited by the resistor in there that keeps the LED from burning out. Who sells those? Unfortunately, they're no longer available. I do have a small supply. <laughs> it's, it's made by a company called Thexton, T-H-E-X-T-O-N, and I looked at their website and they have similar things, but they're gargantuan. They're like for trucks. They make they generally make automotive test equipment. There are others available. Pardon me? Uh, there are others available other than that one company though. Yeah, but that's just particularly nice. I mean we, we could probably I should set up and make them out of doll stock and send them as Christmas presents to everyone, you know, you can do it. A nail, a doll stock, an LED and some cord. It's not, a, it's not a complicated schematic. Not really. Yeah. yeah. Can you uh, say again what sort of system you're talking about? And also, um, I, unless unless you were to do this on a board, I would not know what you just said to do. I have no idea what I just said to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you, you I think we were talking. Information, but God, I'm glad you think so. Um, I was basically talking about going to the output board of, of any system, whether it's um, electromechanical switching, uh, simple solid state switching, or a multiplex system. You're going to want to test whether the outputs are on or off. The point where Some, the chest magnet is wired. That's right, right, right or thereabouts. Um, some of the solid state systems include LEDs right there, which is really great because you can see that it's going on and off, just like the LED on the back of the Harris draw knob or the rocking tablet. It gives you very useful immediate information. But failing that, you want to have some way of testing whether that output is working. So you can use a meter like Manuel described, but the particular system he was talking about was the SSOS multi-system that uses this unusual serial to serial driver chip that has this feature for the automobiles that lets the computer know. Yeah, but you, you're not going to have a light on your console that says magnet dead, you know? Well, you could. There's um, <laughs> the lock of blowers have, uh, the big ones have an oil reservoir with a float on it so that if the oil goes low, you can wire it up to a warning light on the console. Um, our friend Jack Bethards is very good about this. He has, um, he will send to his best friends a mount on the wall thermometer that is called the thermonunciator. <laughs> and his combination action memory control is a rotary switch, and that's the rotonunciator. <laughs> and um, so I said, well, what are you going to do with the lauk of low oil level? He said, well, that's obviously the lubro, lubronunciator. <laughs> so this is, you know, that falls into the area of stuff you really don't want to know. But my point with, with, with the, as much as this does, my point with the light was, when you're checking for output, don't really believe what you see, especially if you're using a high-tech digital electronic <coughs> meter. In these cases, the light bulb can be your best friend. And, and SSOS, mm -hmm. most positive common <coughs> systems all use a similar driver. So if you're on it with a voltmeter, it's going to look healthy. And uh, so the light, 
presents a load. Yeah. I mean, it's basically, it's presenting a load. So. And then, if, as I said, if you're using it as a feed in the opposite yeah. situation, current will flow yeah. through the light bulb to the magnet. And by how bright the light lights, you or not. can, or not, right. or not, not as good. Um, out, of yeah. out of curiosity, could you use that to test whether, say for instance, you have a Wix organ that has, you've removed diodes, but you yes. want to find potentially that one diode that you missed. Perfect example. Okay. You go dim, 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 bright. And if you were doing it without the light in series, if you had a test wire, it would be dim, 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 mm -hmm. dim, blind. So, okay. Yeah. And, and so this is something that you could do before you blow a card. Exactly. And I've used it in putting uh, new systems on Wix organs um, to just get a rough idea of where the heavy current magnets are or base actions with two lever magnets. So you can say, okay, we're going to need heavy duty drivers for notes one to 15 or something like that. So it, it's really, it's a very useful tool. Dick, can you demonstrate that tonight when we go to an actual organ? Uh, I don't want to break it. <laughs> 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 what system does it use? Uh, uh, it's a virtual virtual. Yeah. You can break it. <laughs> yes. well, it's I'll, I'll loan you the test light. We can do it on that system. It's yeah, sure, you can do it on any okay, system. It's, 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 was that? Yeah, it's easy to get that. Right? Yeah. I mean, and anyhow, it's a positive uh, Yeah, but the system. the system in the console won't draw enough current to turn on the light bulb. You want to get somewhere where the magnets are. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. You can, yeah, sure, it can be looked at. Yes? Actually, I'm curious. Uh, do you ever use voltage drops to check for problems in the organ? How do you mean voltage drops? Uh, to, to check to see if there's excessive voltage drop. Oh, I thought you meant like cough drops. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, when we were talking about circuits, remember we talked about you can lose voltage in different parts of the cable? You can, if, if the circuit is on and drawing current, you can set your, your voltmeter to uh, a, a low scale, like, like two volts or something, and measure across the wire, ideally, if the wire were a perfect conductor, it would be zero. But you can actually measure the voltage drop in, in different places. And that might be a way of discovering a bad connection, uh, you know, in a, in a ground circuit. Other questions? All right. Um, <clears throat> so we sort of touched on this already, you know, kind of some systems are negative common, some are positive common. And that's obviously something to keep in mind when you're testing. Um, forcing with a light, I guess that's less. It's foolproof. Yeah, it's foolproof. Foolproof. <laughs> 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 but uh, talk about ways. Um, obviously, you're you're, uh, you're marking your bus bars. You probably couldn't see it in the pictures. We had a buffalo, but you know we had a big plus and a big minus next to the two bus bars, so you didn't know what was what. Um, any other ways to to check if you don't know a system? How do you know which which polar it is? Yeah, if I might dive in here, because I've we my pals and I have made lots of smoke. We were working at a, a very impressive national cathedral a few years ago, um, doing some rewiring and putting in uh, an SSL multi system to replace a Rogers control system that then fed. Peterson diode switching. And whoever had wired the plus and minus to the Peterson used the black and white. Ugh. Ugh. The but dreaded black and white. It's fine in there in that electrical box. <laughs> but a lot of us tend to use red and black, black being the zero volts or negative, and the red being the positive. Um, Germans use black and blue, which kind of describes what you feel like when you're done with wiring one of their systems. But <laughs> um, it's very, very important to check. And my, my colleague, Vladdy, said, oh, black is negative. Putin is no, not no. negative. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes, absolutely. I, I nearly burned a brand new Rieger organ down once, down once. I was there to change some parts on the slider solenoid controls. And the organist said, oh, 
we're having this problem with the combination action. It was one of those modern consoles with light, lighted touch buttons, and the combination action was built by Hoyce. Well, I didn't know anything about it, and I told him that, but I said, sometimes things, problems are stirred up by electrical noise. And so I always travel with a big capacitor, not that, not, not that really big dioplaster, but a smaller one. And so I put a couple of leads on it, opened up the side of the organ, and there are two bus bars. It said plus and minus. I didn't even look at the colors. Hooked it up. The problem I was hoping <coughs> to solve was that sometimes when you switch the organ on, a stop or two would come on. And at the dedication, it was the Zimbelstern that came on. It was sort of embarrassing. <laughs> so here's the organ. I'm standing here. The console is detached, reversed there. The organist turns the on button, and he's smiling. And I'm watching him smile, and I feel really good until he starts frowning. Uh -huh. And he said, is it supposed to be on fire? <laughs> <laughs> I, like a fool, trusted the plus and minus marking. And they were backwards. Oh. So the, the capacitor was the, the, it was the insulation on the short wires yeah. to the capacitor <laughs> that was on fire. So I took a, oh, that happens sometimes. <laughs> and I off to the side. And then 30 seconds later, it exploded. Oh. Oh, and it was like this baby all. vomit puke all over their nice slate floor. <laughs> yes, good idea. <laughs> All right, um, and you touched on the before jumping one output to another, and that's pretty much a no-no in a solid-state system. Is that correct? Well, your turn. Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. If, if you are if you are sure, then yes. yes. But if you're not sure, then no. Then it's a no. <laughs> See, yes or and backwards. No. <laughs> well, the 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 danger yeah. here is that. Whatever solid state device is supplying current to a particular magnet has a rating. Now, if the magnet draws 0.1 uh, amp and the, the device that is supplying current to it is rated at a half an amp, then yes, it'll quite happily work to three or four magnets. But generally, when you're in panic mode in, inside an organ, inside a Winchest, you don't stop to think about what the device is like one doing. of your chests well, yeah. with all the magnets in them. <laughs> uh, so it's best not to, but I mean, has anyone ever done that here? Oh, come on, guys. Everybody. Manuel, lift what, your what's hand. The, everybody. What, Just was say the, yes. what was the real question? Uh, jumping How wired? One note to another. No, of course. Naturally. From, I mean, I've been doing this for 50 years. So. <laughs> Yeah. We didn't have solid state, then, right? You know, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's one of those things I know a lot of us get used to doing on organs that don't have solid mm -hmm. state. Yeah. You just have to be much more careful. Generally, as as, built, as yeah. Bob said, you can do it. Mm -hmm. the, the, I mean, there are systems depending upon whose system you're using, and you don't want to get into the organ. Okay, you you, you don't want to climb the forty <coughs> feet up into the abyss. If you can remove the driver. From the equation, okay, like on a Peterson, get a crowbar and pry hurt your hands. Pry, pry that uh, bloody uh, 156 connector off those pins, or yeah, same on a Sendine, uh, or in the case of a Virtuoso, you can pull the driver card uh, and get to the wire. Then you're free to try to light it up. Remotely, if you like, with a hot wire. Uh, light it up is a word we don't use, nor do we use fire it up. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Peter, Make back it to your play. question, you have a dead note and working notes on either side, mm -hmm. and you're wondering if you can jump. Now, that dead magnet could either be open, in mm -hmm. which case it's not drawing current, or it could be shorted. Right. And it may not be working because it's shorted. And so by jumping it to its perfectly healthy neighbor, it's going to take you its neighbor yeah. yeah, and you yeah. can go down the row and check them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bird. What's your burning question? Oh, I do have a burning question related to what's about uh, Smoke? Sorry. Peterson diode matrix, and I, I had just this issue, a dead note, and I checked it with the neighbor, I couldn't get it to play. And so I took a hot lead and was able to play it directly with the hot lead, and it played fine for a week, and then it died again. 
do the same thing, test it, you know, jump ring the neighbors, playing the neighbors, didn't do it, but hot lead, and I guess there's enough <coughs> voltage drop to the diode matrix that the, that the magnet wasn't playing just through the relay. Is this a direct electric magnet? No, it's oh, a... Oh, pity. Um, you just weaken the spring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> standard, standard electro-pneumatic, and I went up and checked the, the armature. The armature was clean. Um, and so I'm still kind of... Uh, Is it a cold solder droid on the yeah, printed the circuit board? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, and, or, actually, or, or with the magnet connection. Okay. And what was um, somewhere? I did the chest. Because, you know, when soldering, you press, if you press on the contact, you're reconnecting it. Yeah. If you can go back back to what I said earlier, <clears throat> open the circuit, take your voltmeter, ohms, power off, check sure resistance, that. check check the coil. It'll okay. be just fine though, you know that. You know, yeah, but <laughs> you, you can try. Yeah. So you, you can hope. Yeah. Hope springs eternal. eternal. Uh, I vote for a cold solder joy. <laughs> so. Well, and you know that kind of comes <coughs> to the point of you know when you're doing these, some some systems have designated test leads. You're only supposed to use a test lead from a certain position. Um, Peterson, I think they have their test and power junction mm -hmm. board. You're supposed to run a test lead from that. It's uh, never convenient. Never though. No, of course not. Um, virtuoso, you can run it from the negative. Yep into any point. Um, I've not dealt with SSL so much. Well, the first thing I would do is scientifically put a voltmeter on there when you get it to play and see if it's getting the, the correct amount of voltage it should. If the driver is bad and not delivering enough current, oh, yeah. it, it may be enough volts to work it now and then. Another thing, if it's getting the right voltage, is be very suspicious of the chest magnet. I've seen cases where the, the U-shaped pole pieces are not down into the die cast base far enough, so it's not really strong enough to lift the armature under all conditions. That would never happen with a recent chest magnet. No, certainly not. <laughs> and if it does, you return it. And then and they'll send you no. We've never seen that before. <laughs> but if it's a trusty old EM Skinner wood cap magnet, you can just take your drift punch and, you know, adjust it. Uh, well, anyway, go ahead. Um, phantom grounds. Spooky. Mm. <laughs> Trouble. Mm, in River City. Yeah. <laughs> Capital T. Right? Phantom ground, ground or phantom common. Yes. Ah. Not necessarily one and the same. Exactly. So, so what what is that problem? What are some of the symptoms of it? <coughs> AC side or DC side? DC side, let's go with. Okay, well you would hope that your common isn't to your ground, unless somebody has deliberately done it on a modern system. Okay, so are you able to measure through your power supply to the ground? And what do you got? Uh, has the ground been built in a circle? Okay, and that, well, I'll, I'll touch on that a little tomorrow. But all grounding should point in one direction. Matter of fact, all commons should point in one direction to the source. No circles. Okay. Yeah, but the organ you're talking about looks like the one in the pictures back there. Right. There's no <laughs> logic. There's no order. Okay. Okay. And it's it's one of those mystery ghost phantom problems that's sort of in everybody's old toolbox that your your dad and your grandfather would, would talk about. And it can be as simple as having a loose ground on a chest. So let's say you have a ground bus bar with some magnets hooked up to it. And the bus bar is supposed to be, as Bob says, a good solid return to the power supply. But let's say it, someone borrowed the wood screw that connected it to the, to, the, to the wire. And you play C. And C sounds, but so does D sharp. And, and you play D sharp, and you don't get C. It's not a run. You get E or some other things. You know, it's really, really spooky mystery. And that is because the ground is floating. So the current from the console, the key, the control system, whatever, comes into C and it goes down and it's onto the bus bar, which should be zero volts and take all those electrons home, but it isn't. 
it's floating. So it becomes not 12 volts, but maybe 10 volts or 9 volts. And then it sees this whole <coughs> field of possibilities, all the other magnets that are hooked to that same bus bar. Oh, where shall we go? And it'll take the path of least resistance. That, that's what I think of technically with floating grounds. When's the last time all the connections have been tightened? 1873. Right. <laughs> and, 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 there, and therein lies a major problem. Mm -hmm. In older instruments with early solid state systems and early diode matrix systems, is when's the last time you've gone through and checked all your connections? Because the reality is, is the wire compresses, copper compresses, uh, in the telephone industry, we torqued every power connection every year, yeah. okay? Because it it's just the nature of the metal. Mm -hmm. Particularly so, stranded wires. Yeah. 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 Particularly yeah. stranded wire yeah. that someone has tinned. Oh, that's a, oh, that's it looks a beautiful, dog. and you put it in, tighten yeah. it, you come back next week, it's going to be loose. And and on the tinning point, you don't tin stranded wire, okay? It may look nice, and it may be convenient. Mm -hmm for all those multiple insertions and removals you're going to do with it, for whatever reason, two things happen. Well, the, the big thing is it forms a stress point <coughs> up in the jacket. <coughs> Matter of fact, in, airplanes are all wired with stranded wire. Matter of fact, cars are all wired with stranded wire. Okay? And no single connection is soldered. It's either a crimp connection or a compression connection of some sort. Because soldering will cause a stress point that with vibration will fracture. So, thus, uh, but yeah, tinning, tinning is not a good thing, but tightening connections. And, and what you're talking about should easily be found with a voltmeter. Yeah. Measure But you're resistance. just trying to fix the organ, right. you know. You've right. you got to get on with the tuning, you've got to yeah. get to the next job, you've got to go home for dinner. Nobody oh. goes around, oh, look at all these screws in the organ. I'm going to check that they're all nice and <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't do well, no, You're right. You're right. But the reality is, is more and more, it is going to become yeah. long-term a problem well, with solid-state systems. Well, it really is. And as, as I said earlier, if it's an old organ, that well, the magnet will work. The organ is only 14 years old, and it has SSL slider solenoid control cards, <clears> and the compression of the screw <coughs> on the little clamp. Mm -hmm. We're loose. For the terminal every, block where you every connect the wires. single one in the organ could be turned a half a turn or more. In Europe, you often see stranded wire that has a, uh, a, a, barrel, sleeve, on a barrel on it. That's and then that down. barrel is crimped. A ferrule. Yeah. A ferrule. Yeah. A ferrule. Yeah. A ferrule. Yeah. Not the kind of ferrule that you have as a pet. No, no. <laughs> so that's not a ferrule. Uh, there's, there's, a tool, there's a tool sitting behind me that puts those on. Yeah, so, and, and so that that's that's very good. It will compress a lot less uh, over time. One of the things with Pearson that I got from them the first thing you do is go into the connector and wiggle it. Take it on and off. Yeah, these, these are the weak links in, in any system. And in fact, even even in solid state systems, very often the fault will come down to a bad solder connection. It's basically mechanical. It's not electronic, even though it's in an electronic system. And a tight, a tight connection on a plug-in type connector, like the Peterson 156s or, or, or anybody, a tight connection does not guarantee long-term survival. Okay. Um, it's it's atmosphere. It's I know some companies for a while were putting uh, a treatment on them. I'm not so sure that that has been long lived. Uh, but the the idea of rocking a connector, your best bet is to unplug it all together right. and uh, throw it away. <laughs> that too. <laughs> that too. That's a choice. But. Uh, uh, yeah, so, I mean, some of these are so ridiculously tight, uh, and, and I've seen on ridiculously tight connections uh, high resistance across them yeah. uh, over time. Environmental cycles alone cause things to go like this. So, 
It's amazing you got two pieces of wire mashed together and the mm -hmm. current doesn't yeah. go through. And yeah. what are your opinions on insulation displacement? So convenient. So convenient and so prone to problems. Depends. I think yeah. I think you have to follow the manufacturer's instructions about what gauge wire, what type mm -hmm. of insulation that they've designed the do you know all know what insulation displacement no. connectors are? No? We're gonna talk about that tomorrow, but it is a uh, type of connector that usually has at least two surfaces. Some actually have four surfaces that slice through the insulation and then make contact with the conductor. Um, and it's called where's, a gas tight. Yeah, where's, Ma where's Matt? Where's Matt? Where's Matt? Oh, by the way, anybody encounters Matt, just ask him how he likes Amphenol connectors. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is like gas on a raging fire, <laughs> but will be worth it. Yeah. Uh, the, the entire communications industry I, is we IDC. Use them. We use it's various t forms of IDC, and there's there's multiple multiple forms of them. They are reliable when done by the book. Okay, right tool, With right, right connector, tools, yeah. right tool. And the right gauge wire. Right, right, right tool, right connector, right app, and we're going to do some of that tomorrow. So the point of it is, it's yeah. a punch down tool, right. not a screwdriver. No. no. Or a or six no. rule, you know, for sure. But they can be soldered, you know. Yes, they can. <laughs> but they shouldn't be. They, like wire rack. That, 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 do you that, want, does everybody oh. understand a wire wrap connection? Yeah. What constitutes a legal wire wrap connection? No. A legal wire wrap connection must go onto a square or rectangular pin. Right. Mm -hmm. An oval or round pin doesn't count. Now you will solder it. Uh, and there should be no less than six and a half wraps around the pin to make it a legal connection. And ultimately, you end up with no less than 24, 26 contact points around the wire. And when used with the right tool, it pulls it to a pre-specified tension that, again, in the telephone industry, I know there's connections out there that have been out there since the 60s that were wire wrapped in. When you wire wrap pr properly, yeah. uh, you actually end up with, with welds at every yeah. contact. Point. Yeah, they're called yeah. gas tight connections. Yeah, because basically you yeah. put enough, you know, there's no temperature involved, but there's enough yeah. mechanical force that pushes them against that square post mm. at each corner that it is in fact welded. The most, most failures of insulation displacement type connectivity is because the wrong wire size was used, the wrong tool was used, um, somebody has been in and out of the connector way too many times, somebody has tried to resolve a problem with a screwdriver, okay? Um, oh yeah, I can, I can stick it into that 66 block tool. And I, I, I brought samples of a lot of this stuff that you'll be able to see and play with tomorrow. Uh, but uh, there is absolutely nothing wrong with an insulation displacement connection when, by, when done by the book. So, uh, and you'll get to see how it works. So does that mean that termination pins that we normally use, the brads in a chest, are not? They need to be soldered. Right, but... Uh, you can use no, it, but they still need no to be round. soldered. Okay. Still need to be soldered. Okay, but they don't have to be square. No. You can wrap them with the wrap gun. No. But you got to solder. Okay. Exactly. Okay. With a square pin, okay. the with a square, square post, there's no solder. Yes. Okay. I see. Yeah. Within the industry, you'll find these these wire wrapping tools, yeah. but they're designed to be used with square posts that then are don't need to be soldered. We use them for on escutcheon pins. It's great. It mm -hmm. saves the carpal elbow wrist thing. But you still go back and oh, absolutely. Tag. Oh, yeah, tag. Oh. Yeah. Solder. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. Some guys can get away with not soldering a whole organ, and it works. I miss one. Not for our yeah, Not for long. Not for our Right. So. All right. Um, one other thing I thought we'd talk about was just in system design in general. Um, there's differences between different systems with distributed and central processing. Can we talk about pros and cons of that. 
Oh, oh. Uh, it's called passing the. Uh, Pleased to meet you. How are you? You going to talk about this? Are you going to talk about this? No. Oh well, yeah, we can talk about it. The uh, one I've been around longer than this man, and, and you know, peddling solid state to the whole disbelief of the industry. Um, and the problem, the problem we had in this country was that some folks delved into solid state control systems that were built by engineers who didn't know enough about the organ because the organ builder couldn't possibly tell them everything he needed to know, or uh, vice versa. So there were these unhappy marriages. Um, <clears throat> and some of the early multiplex systems were faulted because you have all of the information coming down to one wire. And if there's a failure of any part in that one stream, the whole organ goes dead. By comparison, you, you've got a main cable with 787 wires in it. No matter what happens to some of them, some of the organ will still work. You'll get noise out of it. So uh, people were very suspicious about processors where, um, where so much goes through a, a central unit. Um, one of the... Um, Ways. Well, how shall I explain this? Why don't you talk for a while? No, no, you're on your way. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're on your. I way. know where I'm on my way too. Yeah, you're digging your hole, but that's okay. Yeah, we're, okay. We're, we're with you. Shovels, anyone? <laughs> we'll, we'll grab you by the wrist as you go yeah. by. So the um, the earliest uh, multiplex switching systems were were single units. Uh, they may not even have had a processor. The first uh, solid state logic one was just um, logic ICs that are logic gates. There was no central brain. And it was very fast. You could do the two by four trick and it would all pass through in you know two milliseconds. Whereas um, computers, which are you know very, very fast and appear to be very smart, still can only do one thing at a time. So one of the one of the reasons some companies have gone to distributed processors is to take the load off one of them. So you may have, um, let's, I'll take an example of Longwood Gardens, which is uh, the largest organ Aeolian ever built. It's 10,010 pipes, is that yeah. right, Joe? Thereabouts. Anyway, it has seven enclosed divisions and a console. And um, we did it with, um, the SSOS multiplex system, which is distributed processing. So there is a processor and an associated pin board in each of the seven divisions, and they connect via Ethernet to an Ethernet switch, like you'll have in your home or office on the computer. And then the computers in the console feed into it, so it immediately gets distributed. An advantage to that is that if there's a failure in one place, well, in that order, you just play something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, that's all I have to say. All legitimate. You're, you're, you're right. Technology, though, continues to march on. Um, most of the systems out today are central processing. SS, SSOS has remained distributed. <clears throat> um, It's, it's more of, how not to offend, of, yes, uh, it, it's, it's more of, of, of opinion, um, and it's, but in some cases it also becomes, and, and, the, and the average organ, it probably isn't that big a deal one way or another, okay, in the, in the average organ, but let's talk about our favorite project, mm -hmm. Buffalo Holy Trinity. With, <laughs> uh, which had such a list of special needs. Okay, I mean this. Is, yeah, special <laughs> needs. Okay. Uh, Were they needs or just requests? Requests. Well, if you ask Jimmy Bigum, death was coming without them. Absolutely need. Okay. Okay. Uh, this host of just extreme special needs, and in this case, it's an organ with, with 
total 190 something speaking stops within we throw the walk around and so on and uh, yes, 152 ranks isn't enough yeah exactly and, and a 50 rank building okay uh, could you give an example of these special things yeah. two consoles um, that big five manual near identical. That, right, yeah, a five manual console up front that has uh, more controls than the space shuttle, uh, and then uh, the equivalent of an Allen three manual in the back. Um, and oh, by the way, I have to be able to drive combination selections that I've made on the front organ from the rear organ. I have to be able to select certain stops that are on the front organ, from the rear organ, but have the rear organ still remain independent. Be able to swap the information uh, so I can have combination action at, at either end. Um, and then you get into the whole laundry list of, I don't know, how many, what is that, seven pages, eight pages, the autumn list, as I used to call it. Yeah. Uh, the spreadsheet <laughs> that was, I don't know, seven, eight pages of, of all this functionality, okay? Doing it with central processing, ultimately, what happened for that organ was there, the two processors that, that, that are in the two consoles that drive the entire organ um, are pretty much identical. And the code that's in them, the definitions that are in them, are identical. The one in the rear just doesn't have everything showing up in your face. But in proper conditions can be called upon. Either console can drive the organ completely independently of the other being alive. Uh, you can kill the one and play from the other and vice versa. Um, and so when you get in, into distributed processing of that, that makes it a little, uh, if it's two identical consoles, distributed processing is a breeze. But when you get into this, this ever-growing laundry list of I want some of this and I want some of that, um, to have it all living in one place, accessible from either end, and that's basically what happens is the organ, the organ on an IOTI system, uh, the organ itself is dumb. It's just, it's just communication boards with drivers on the end of them. Um, it's the data connection from either console. It's similar, it's similar in scope to Peterson. Uh, Peterson has a little more horsepower out there in the, in the ICS, uh, some, some processing. But uh, it's, it's a horse apiece on, on the average organ. Um, you know, some people say distributed processing is faster. Well, it, it, again, depends upon circumstances and the hardware that's in front of it. Uh, if you got enough horsepower in the machine up front, um, that should be ir irrelevant. It's just, yeah, I'll, I'll touch on a misnomer. Fiber is not better. Fiber is just a medium of data transmission, okay? It does not prevent lightning and surge, okay? It may prevent its transmission from one place to the other through the system, but it doesn't eliminate the potential for being hit by surge or lightning. Mm -hmm. uh, is it faster? The reality is, is uh, copper communications that exist today are faster than any organ needs. Okay, I mean, Ethernet in, in, the, right, in the right realm. I mean, hey, if, if, if 100 megabit Ethernet isn't fast enough, go gig E, okay? I mean, even the largest instruments on the planet cannot consume the bandwidth of a gig E connection. So it's... <laughs> I mean, I think certain systems have better architectures. Um, I mean, I did two and a half years as a partner with Dwight. And I, you know, I, I'll just say it. I mean, the system, the system from a design standpoint was designed where wiring, as an example, is a static thing. You wire the organ, and then you plug driver cards into a motherboard, and you never touch the cable and the wiring again. Okay, and if you need to redesign that driver board, you redesign the driver board. Uh, there's nothing wrong with any other system out there. I, I'm just I, I'm from the telecom world where I never want to touch the wire again. Okay, when I wire something, I, if I have to replace a component in it, if I have to replace a circuit pack in it, I don't want to have to touch the cabling or the wiring. 
because it always raises the specter of another potential failure later. So, question. Probably a dumb question, but no I dumb mean, question. It's, uh, uh, we've spent a lot of time discussing uh, AWG and electricity mm -hmm. through wires. We're starting to talk about data through mm -hmm. cables and whatnot. I mean, is, is, are, is this going to be something we're going to touch on, the fundamental difference of that, or if there's code things for running data cables that are different from the electrical, uh, or the, what we've been speaking of to this point, like data versus just straight electricity, is there anything? It's part of the Oregon system. It falls under 650. Technically, there may be, but the reality is it's a signal cable. <coughs> and all, almost every signal cable I know that's out there is 26, 24, 22 gauge, depending upon. So you're, you're well within the realm of the quote wire specification. Uh, and that's what Cat 5 is as yeah, well? Yeah, so Cat 5 is 24 gauge. Okay. Insulation yeah. specifications right. depending on where you're passing the water. Right, whether it's riser. yeah, whether it's riser, uh, plenum rated, plenum rated has a different burn and off gassing than the standard Cat Five. It's Cat Five, Cat Five E, Cat Six, Cat Seven is out there. Uh, unless you're running it through an air duct or or or, or environmental system. Um, uh, across a suspended ceiling yeah. house is an area. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, a lot of suspended ceilings are return air systems. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, you can, the easy air on data cabling is always air for plenum rated, and you're done. Just don't even think about it, okay? And it's, it's only that little bit more money. Um, and if you don't want to make your own, there are several companies out there that make very inexpensively you know, you can order any custom length you want with any type of connection range you want on the end of it. You can order it with hardened ends on it. You can, you can buy hardened ends. I mean, it's uh, you, does you see, you see has hardened uh, barrel connectors on it. Uh, you'll see what hardened ends, and you can do that yourself. You don't have to buy a cable with hardened ends. You can, it's a, um, I don't know, it's about a three dollar kit. You buy snaps on the end and. Uh, but the, the whole distributed versus non-distributed, I mean, I personally have my preferences. I think Dick maybe he has his preferences. Uh, in the end, in the end is, is the system sustainable and maintainable? Also, can it cope? When you, when you think about, you know, you're talking about the amount of data you can push down an Ethernet cable. We watch movies on our computers. And that's, you know, there's a whole lot more data there than ever comes spitting out of an organ console. And an organist has basically only two hands and two feet. There can only be a certain number of things going in. Now, it may spread out massively on the other end, but the whole point of good system design is to make sure there's enough horsepower to do reasonable things. Well, it, it's like, like the fusing. You know, what is it, two by four reasonable? Um, I saw a system once where when everything was on, the sports was on, and it was a distributed processing system. The two by four did whack, 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 whack. And most of the divisions were going whack, 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 except the solar was going whack, 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 <laughs> and finally it caught up. And that was a uh, lack of horsepower. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, with very few exceptions today, all the systems out there will do 98% of anything you want to throw at them. Okay. I mean, yeah, there's the exceptions. There's the odd exceptions. I mean, because it, doing Buffalo Holy Trinity was an absolute exercise and mm -hmm. keeping track of a, a moving target to some extent. Um, and uh, halfway through, I finally said to Rick, I said, you know, we would have been smarter to figure out a way to get another $100,000 out of them, build them another, a new five manual console for down front, put the old one up back, and then we wouldn't have spent all this time trying to figure out how to make these two stupid things talk to each other. Uh, but uh, Sounds like fitting 10 pounds in a five pound set. That's exactly what it was. Uh -huh. So, uh, What's the Opus 2 system? Is that a distributed system? Or, I mean, you've used that, right? What's that like? Just in series, isn't it? Um, well, they you can. It's it's a cardboard box product. It's extremely clever and quite high tech, and uh, a third the price of the next cheapest switching system. Um, but you get a cardboard box with boards in it and very few instructions. So there's a very 
I can speak personally from this, a very steep learning curve. Uh, but at any rate, um, you can configure it on just one processor. The board is this big. It's really scary small. And it will do, in a, in a typical organ, it'll do the um, coupling, unification, combination, action, and record playback. Well, I, I don't know. It's and truly transposer. And, and transposer and, and all that, that stuff. sort of stuff. But you can configure it as uh, a simple two-location multiplex system. Or you can, like, like Scott in our shop, has um, three theater consoles and two organ chambers. And then it, then it becomes distributed. But it, I guess you, you just connect it to the data cable, and it pretty much looks after itself. Right. You could distribute the boards where you want. Yeah. They interconnect with a LAN cable. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a central board, let's say, in the console. You could put boards in the stop jams, in the couplers. And all you have to do is connect it to the LAN cables and plus and minus. Mm -hmm. And then when it's programmed, you have to just tell it what to do. And any board will be an input or an output board. You don't have discrete input boards or output boards. Yeah, this is a new feature. There's a new Jonathan feature. So any it. wire that you put into a 64-pin di insulation displacement connector mm -hmm. becomes an input or an output. And that you handle it all in and the And you program. can connect them randomly, but that's Well, no, tacky. we we do on off on off on off. <laughs> <laughs> they also make an interesting thing that the uh, Jonathan Buchanan, who does a lot of work at the Wanamaker store um, and Atlantic City and Atlantic City, Kurt Mangel got him involved, is the the guru of Opus Two. Opus Two was developed by a guy named David Milton up up in Canada. Um, He's a very clever guy, and he does all kinds of things, but he builds these systems. Um, the real downfall is the lack of uh, technical support on the phone when you need it, mm -hmm. especially a newbie uh, doing this. Anyway, um, Jonathan is this young man. He's got a background in organ service, and he's applied uh, Opus II switching to the Wanamaker organ and is now in the process of doing it at Atlantic City. Um, for the OHS convention, they got some of the left chamber. Well, your left. The left chamber whose uh, relays have been, been thrown away. Thrown away and it's been That's dead a, for a half century. Mm -hmm. uh, he got a bunch of that up and working. He's very, very smart. Um, they make a, Opus 2 makes a uh, little board that plugs onto the back of the SAM, of a stop action mm -hmm. magnet, a stop key magnet, or on the back of a draw knob. And it has a uh, little power supply and a capacitor to store energy. And you, it only needs three wires, plus, minus, and data. And they just loop from knob to knob to knob to knob, or tab to tab to tab. And so what you have coming off of a big stop jam is not this, but you know, three mm -hmm. wires. And what they've done there, it's, I guess it's an extension of distributed processing, mm -hmm. where instead of having the logic on an output board that has 64 outputs and you wire on, off, on, off, on, off coil. Um, it moves it up to uh, the device itself. And Mr. Morani, Arpad Morani, who developed those Hall Effect things, has taken it a step even further on this Casavant organ he's installing in his own hall. He's putting the intelligence and the memory on every device, on every magnet, on every draw knob, on every slider solenoid. So there is no CPU. It, I guess it's the ultimate in mm. distribution. I don't like the idea that that particular stop knob knows what it's supposed to do with every piece of music I play. And if it fails, I'm going to put in another one that hasn't a clue when to come on. But he says there's a way of backing it up. So there are so many ways of skinning a cat. Personally, I'm not fond of that loop. Yeah, it's I know. Just, it's a little too much voodoo for me. Mm -hmm. Alan's, I like Alan's wire, discrete been, wires. Alan does something. Like Alan's it. been doing it. Yeah, Alan's for years. been doing it for ages. Right. At first, yeah. it used to go bump, 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 bump. Yes. And now they get it all to work at once. Yeah. Yeah. It still does that. You just you just don't see it yeah. exactly. Um, I went to visit Cameron Carpenter when he did a gig in Detroit to <clears> see this. Uh, Marshall and Ogletree. Marshall and Ogletree. It's not a Marshall and Ogletree console. It's a um, Colby. Colby. Roger Colby built it. 
and it's extremely clever engineering. It all comes apart into road cases. 20 or 30 minutes has it apart and packed or put together. There is, um, there is a road case that slips under the, the main key desk, and it has uh, a scissors lift in it. It lifts the key desk up, and then you roll away the, the pedal board and the legs. Uh, there are some steel things that come out, and the stop gems, which is rocking tablets, move aside, and it has three wires, plus, hmm. minus, and data. Yeah. The combination action is actually from Classic in Canada. And I don't know who made that data unit on the back of the SAMs. I didn't spot that. But at any rate, it's very clever, and that's a, a real good application for this thing mm -hmm. that Manuel doesn't like. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I think the key thought that has to always be in the forefront, because the control system industry is a cottage industry. Uh, I mean, that's painful to say. Uh, there's probably a couple people in the industry who would wish to debate that, but it's a cottage industry. How many have we got? Seven now? Seven? Eight control yeah, system manufacturers? Control eight? I mean, it's, it's a ridiculous number for an industry that has a limited market. Okay, um, you know, I mean, you got you got one, kind of one and a, one and a half main suppliers to the entire industry on the organ side of things, and we got umpteen control system manufacturers. Uh, you build an organ. You know, this isn't like the old days where 50 years ago you, you put an organ in that had an electromechanical or electric, uh, whatever system in it that pretty much anybody in this room could fix, okay, uh, and keep the organ running. And now we're putting in a whole lot of hardware out there that for the most part is reliable. I mean, there's no argument the products aren't reliable, but it's a cottage industry that keeps changing. And, every, and it's just like listening to this Opus 2, people want to jump on the hottest bandwagon, okay? And the hottest bandwagon is not necessarily in the best interest of the industry. Uh, how many control systems have been replaced over the years? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll bring up Devtronics or Rickman or Uniflex, okay? Uniflex truly is one guy in his house in Arizona. Now the theater organ world loves it because it's configurable on, on your PC, so on and so <coughs> forth. Um, you know, any artist can walk in and build any stop on demand and, and rearrange the console if they so wish by sitting down in front of the PC for a few minutes to an hour or so. Uh, but the real problem is, is I personally know that the, the only <coughs> other person in North America who knows a Uniflex system inside and out, including both the hardware and the software. And this is a guy who's not even in the industry. Okay, um, I'm not picking on matters, but you know, here's matters. It's one and a half guys, and I've always joked, one, one of them is going to go out and accidentally chainy the other. Uh, you know, Accidentally, what? what? Are Cheney, you talking about? Cheney shoot. Oh, oh, okay. Is that a verb? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so much, you, you put all this energy into building this <coughs> giant piece of mechanical and musical art, and it's all hinged on a product that's a big expense. That's part of a very cottage industry, and there are really, in, in my book, there's only three or four legitimate contenders out there. Um, and they're not, they all necessarily don't have the perfect sauce, but 20 years from now, when you need parts for that instrument or need support, will they be there? And what's and what's the future chain going to look like? And that's a mm. it's a hard pill to swallow. Um, it's technology moves on, but the organ industry, the, the people, the or the organ owner does not want to hear with a twenty year old organ. They got to put a new control system in the organ. 
But this does happen, and I know we, we want to build these monuments that will certainly outlive us and maybe go on for a couple generations. But the tr fact of the matter is, I suppose everyone in this room has replaced a control system mm -hmm. in an organ, be it Reisner relays mm -hmm. or um, even early single memory level mm -hmm. systems yeah. that were perfectly functional, but they don't offer the features that are wanted. And if you look, look at most any organ, the cost of the control system is one of the smaller line items. We, it, it's something we live and breathe and eat and think is very important, but in the big scale of things, it's just the box that, that controls it. And I, I'd like to think that in the future, when uh, Mr. Milton goes heavenward in Canada and, there's, and, and Jonathan Buchanan has gotten a real job, and there's no one around to service Opus II, there'll be something around that can replace it. Uh, but I think if you're looking for uh, to be very conservative, you want to consider the installed base and the track record of, of the control system. Because large systems like Peterson, if Peterson would go, to b go bust, there are a lot of people around who understand the system and can support it.